Hi, everybody. It is day 10 of the uh, challenge. I'm here today with uh, Nursa Douglas. So Nursa is a functional nutritionist, uh, lives here in Bermuda, um, and she's working at a clinic here on the island. So tonight, Nursa and I are going to speak on, she'll talk about her experience using the Freestyle Libra personally, and then um, how gut health impacts blood sugar and some of the experiences that she shared with her clients as well. Hi. There you are. Hi, everyone. Lovely to um, be here. Thank you for the invite, Dr. Keenan. Great to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. And, you know, you and I have great conversations, and I think people are we really do. going to to uh, to benefit from this call tonight as well. Yeah, we do. Um, just so uh, everyone knows, um, I um I'm really big into gut health and um, Dr. Keenan and I often have a lot of conversations about how um, the gut pretty much governs our whole being and how important those little microorganisms really are for um, not just for the diabetes side of things, but for our overall health, our hormone balances, our mood, um, our sleep patterns. Um, we can probably spend um, all night just talking about like the different roles that these microorganisms have. Um, and actually, um, earlier on today, um, I was talking with Dr. Keenan and a few um, uh, people at the Diabetes Centre, and I was just saying, I just wish I knew now what I knew. I, I wish 20 years ago I knew what I know now about how important our gut biome is, um, in the sense that I probably wouldn't have been having as many of the um, kind of additives and artificial sweeteners and things like that, that now we know how harmful they are to our gut biome. Um, but the good news is we can build it all back up again, depending on um, the foods that we're eating and how we're eating um, and to try to encourage a really healthy biome. Yeah, and the gut is where it's at, you know, and for people that don't even some people still don't know that term, you know, the microbiome, but really yeah. the future of medicine is is looking at this one of these major uh, parts of our body is our, our digestive system, our digestive tract. Um, I do think the future of medicine too is our mind and how we think. Um, but next to that, um, we definitely know that the microbiome has a huge impact. And I'll just say one story, <laughs> just because I think it gets people's attention, yeah. is that to know how important the gut microbiome is, um, people are using fecal transplantation, which means transplanting the, the stool of someone else to have a better health outcome. So this has been going on now for a number of years for a bacteria called Clostridium difficile, but it's also being used experimentally for people that have extensive Crohn's, colitis, Alzheimer's disease, autism. So we know that is powerful. My friend who is a psychiatrist is also using fecal transplantation for anxiety. So when your gut is off, so many things can happen. And one of the things that we see all the time is when the gut is off, blood sugar goes up, right? We see insulin resistance. So, um, so Nursa, tell us, what was it like for you, I guess, just because everyone's kind of shared when you put the Freestyle Libre monitor on, what was that kind yeah. of like, just your own story? Um, so I was, um, I consider myself eating um, a very minimal amount of sugar. Um, obviously, like, you know, I, I like a glass of wine, but I probably wouldn't drink in the week that much. Um, in terms of refined carbs, next to zero um unless like i don't know i'm going to a dinner or something or um we're going out to a restaurant in which case then i'll eat as i please for the most part because i think food um my motto is food for enjoyment it shouldn't be a source of stress for you as long as you care you're careful in terms of like what you're doing around it um I, i'm all about the 80 20 rule personally um Despite that, having said that, and I exercise very regularly, not, not because of anything else, but it's really good for my mental health. Um, I feel good after it. It's kind of like my me time. So um, most days involve, so it, it, even if it's just like a walk, um, we have a dog that is very hyperactive that needs a lot of walking. Um, so it's, often it's just a walk, but, often, but it can be more than that. Anyway, what I'm getting at is I was very surprised to see my morning levels as high as they were. And most mornings for me, I'd start upwards of 90, possibly into the hundreds. Um, 
So this was really interesting for me to see. And that's not me, me having a carby meal in the evening either. Um, and I typically do a 16-8 fast. So I, um, my eating window is only for eight hours. So I stop eating around 7 p.m. Um, and I typically get up about 6.37 in the morning. Now, I understand that in the mornings you get a little bit of a um, rise because of the cortisol levels in our body. And we'll come back to talk about that, I'm sure, later on. Um, but one of the things um, that I suffer from is um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So I metabolize sugars very similar to a diabetic person would. Um, and I thought that I had everything under control the way I was eating, but clearly my numbers were still quite elevated. So that's something that I've been investigating more. And so that led me to look at my gut biome myself again. And so I ran a stool sample test and sure enough, there's dysbiosis there. So I'm actually working with Dr. Keenan now quite closely just to see like where this dysbiosis is coming from because I am having all the right foods that you should be having to increase the good bacteria and kind of balance this dysbiosis. Um, but I've not necessarily seen those results. Um, so that's where I'm at with that. Um, for a typical day for me, I, unless I do a, like a 24 hour fast, which I don't typically do, but because I was having so many kind of um, bloating, gas issues um, and things like that, I felt really uncomfortable. So I actually went and did a three day fast um, which, you know, may or may not be for you. Um, even after 24 hours, I felt so, so much better. And it was only then that I started seeing numbers in their 50s. But other than that, my numbers are always 90 and above. Um, and I'll peak to say 120, 110, 120. It'll come back down fairly quickly again. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is everyone's base is different. So I wouldn't get too, too hung up. Um, is that right, Dr. Keenan, about what your number is as long as it's kind of you know why it's going up and it's coming back down again it's not staying elevated for a prolonged amount of time and you can you know why that's happening so if you're having I don't know like a kale salad with um olive oil and a bit of balsamic on it and it's shooting up then there's a problem <laughs> but if like you know if you had a cookie or something and you can explain the peak then there's an explanation for it um so I've been working really really hard um like I said before, gut health is everything to me. Um, I've worked really hard on myself. Um, I My philosophy is that I wouldn't recommend something that I haven't tried myself or I haven't tried. Um, my husband's my guinea pig as well <laughs> on one of us. So most of the things that I, um, I, I'll talk to you about have been tried and tested. So I like to talk from experience personally. Um, so I've been trying hard to kind of build my bio, bio own back again um, and also looking at my hormones as well. So we know that also um, those uh, the, the gut bacteria have an impact on not only um, our sugar balance, but also our hormonal health as well. So um, it's a work in progress. Um, and yeah, I think we just need to do our best every day and, uh, and progress will happen. Um, with all things holistic, it's good to get to the root of the cause of the problem and try to um, solve that rather than try to mask things, um, which I guess previously I've been um, at fault at, like trying, you know, in previous years, maybe before I knew as much as I know now, um, you know, maybe taking things, um, antacids for example for indigestion things like that whereas we know now if you're getting signs of that as an example then you know you need to look into it why that might be happening rather than try to mask it with an antacid so and that's a little bit about my history <laughs> but it's so great you bring those things up nurse because so many people they don't you know and still um you know we think of we just kind of band-aid solutions you know an antacid yeah. here the stools aren't have to take laxatives but exactly. all of that is a sign. And so, you know, more and more now, one of my fundamental questions I ask people is what does your poop look like? And yeah. I even have a diagram in my office and I say, which of these which does your one? poop look like? I have exactly the same in my office and I'll, you know, open, we know we'll spend a good 15, 20 minutes talking about the poop because it tells us so much, you know, the color of it, the consistency of it, the regularity of it, um, whether we can see food particles in there. Like, you know, that's the other thing because, you know, if uh, if our gut's not working properly, we could be eating all the right foods, but if it's not being digested and utilized, you're essentially pooping it all out. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm with you with that. Like the poop, the poop situation <laughs> is very important. And so when, when we're working with patients and you've started seeing people, so when they're coming in, you know, because you get a lot of assessments, you know, for diabetes, for pre-diabetes, for PCOS, you know, like yourself. Yeah. 
So kind of how, what's your approach like then when you're dealing uh, with patients that come in with these types of concerns? Well, um, normally my fir- like the first consultation, um, I have an hour slot, but honestly, I'm now thinking of maybe pushing that into an hour and a half. And when I was talking to my um, 75 year old dad about this, he's like, what earth did you talk about for an hour and one out of time? I was like, well, you'd be surprised <laughs> because the more like, I'm like a sponge and I want to like absorb all this information because like everything that like the more the more um pieces of the puzzle I've got the better like the puzzle is going to look so you know um and we talk in depth about sleep patterns what do they look like what's your sleep hygiene like what's your device um situation like are you on devices right until bed are you sat in front of a computer all day long what your stress levels like what else is going on in your life um When's the last time you had your poop checked? Um, what are your eating habits like? Uh, so, so many different things to talk about. And so before I know it, the hour's kind of just over and I feel like I need a little bit more time. But as a general rule, um, again, I come back to this gut health thing um, because it's so important to me and I, I truly believe it's the root of everything. We spend a lot of time talking about, you know, the types of food people are eating, how they're eating, their eating habits, um, their meal timings, um, their use of fermented foods of prebiotic, probiotic rich foods. Um, and um, so that generally gives me an idea of um like where that person is so a lot of people will come and they're already very clued up on the resistant starches and the fermented foods and the probiotics and prebiotics and things like that and then so there's no point really covering grounds when they're already quite read up about it so then we start to maybe look at hormonal health or sleep patterns or you know other things that could come into play as well so really it's a really tailored approach and it just depends on what um presents when that I sit with that in front of that person Um, and that's what I really love about it because there is no um, crib sheet to give out because every single individual is different. And although, you know, I said that I, I try everything out on myself and my husband, et cetera, not to say it's going to work for you. Like we're all so unique. I mean, genetically, we've got the same genes, um, but the way we process things is very, very different. So it takes um, a lot of working very closely to come up with bespoke plans that are individual for that person. Um, as a great general rule, like you kind of know your like where you're heading with it, but then, you know, in, you need to fine tune it so that it's specific for the patient and so when they come like you know they're referred to you say for diabetes yes. and then you start talking about their gut yes. do you think people make are making the association or are some people definitely not because they're like well I you know um sorry I'm just gonna switch this up I um <laughs> um I poop every day. Um, it's all good. Like there's no issue with my gut. I never get bloated. I never get indigestion. Um, <laughs> there's no need to talk about that. And then, so then, then, then there's the education part of things to actually explain, like there's a little bit more to it than that. And, you know, and then, so we go into a little bit more depth and, and, and nine times out of 10, people are actually really, really surprised as to the impact that um, these bacteria have on our overall health. Yeah, and, exactly. and, and you know, not just the diabetes and um, diabetic patients, the um, but the, you know the um, uh, the premenopausal women that I see, right? So that they they're always very surprised at how much um, their hormonal health is impacted by their gut health. Um, people with sleep disturbances, and um, people, you know, um, with um, kind of mood mood swings and that kind of stuff, and you know, that gut brain axes is a real thing. Like those, um, they're, they're they're communicating multiple trillion times a second. So whatever's going on in here is going on there, and vice versa. So. Um, and you know with some of the analogy that people like I'll stick to my gut like there's a reason like you know when you're feeling unsettled and stuff your stomach does feel a bit funny doesn't it like you get like butterflies we use that a lot to describe what's going on so there's definitely communication um, way more than um, we give credit to what do you find are the most common questions or that people have when you know they come in when they start talking about their gut health um so uh, the most common questions are what foods should you be eating to promote a good biome um and and diversity is key um there was a study in um the journal the gut and um they actually uh, recommended 30 different types of plant food a day 
And when I read that, I was like, okay, we live in Bermuda. That's going to be kind of challenging because diversity is really not on our side for the most part. And food is expensive. So you obviously like, you know, if you're, um, there's only two of us in the house, I'm always aware that I don't want to be wasting stuff. Um, but when I read, when I kind of looked into it a little bit more detail, I realized it's not as difficult as I first imagined. Because if you think that all herbs and spices count towards that, number as would do things like seeds and nuts and you know things like chia seeds like anything that really comes from the um the ground like from a plant counts towards you know producing that beautiful diversity that we want in our gut um so on the back of that um a lot of people um through bringing bermuda through just you know ease through um just habit seem to eat the same things again and again and i can be definitely can be um uh, uh, I could put my hand up and say you know we go through patterns of that as well um, but one of the things I say is like every time you go to the supermarket try to pick up one thing that you're curious about that maybe you haven't tried before or looks different to you even if it's just a different type of lettuce like if you look at all the different types of lettuce that there are available and um, ranging in different colors and textures like you know most people would just go to their bog standard romaine or um, an iceberg or or maybe like a spinach leaf but if you think about the different types of leaves that you can actually make the base of a lettuce with right so you've got various different types of kale on this island right that grows really really freely which is super fresh and we know it hasn't been you know picked three months ago and sat on a, sat on a container somewhere um we have um lots of different types of um lettuce that the farmers are producing here so not only is it obviously uh, helping the economy um but it's also a lot fresher as well. Um, so I think from um, the organic farm I bought last week, um, kale, I bought um, romaine, uh, I bought fresh Bermuda arugula. Um, so these are all different leaves that you can add in there. Then you've got things like the radicios and more the bitter taste, which we know that is amazing for our digestion as well. So just with the lettuce alone, you could add like five or six different things without even thinking about it. Um, and then you've got your... I was going to say that you brought up to eat local because I think that's important. You know, in Canada, soon we'll, gardens will start producing again more. But when you eat local as well, we're, you're getting often a higher quality food because it doesn't come on that transit time. You know, you're supporting local farmers um, yeah. and the nutrients actually can be better then much better much better because we know that the, as soon as um the, the the produce comes out of the ground like it starts to like lose nutritional value on top of that our soils unfortunately due to monocropping are not as rich as they would have been even a generation or two generations ago so we can't be affording to lose any nutritional value and you know by eating locally at least we know um like the farm that i like to go to um, you can pick your own like it can't get much fresher than that um, or even you know the things that are available locally in Bermuda and I'm sure in Canada and the US and the UK as well there are kind of like organic farms that are quite fresh or farmers markets that people can go to um, and you know and you know this organic situation comes up where you know is it affordable is it not affordable what do we do and then um, I personally, food is so incredibly expensive all over the world now, um, especially in here in Bermuda, because a lot of our food is imported. So I always try to personally for our family, um, try to buy the dirty dozen. I'm sure. Um, have you spoken about the dirty dozen at all? We haven't this far. You no. So it, yeah. there's a dozen <laughs> foods um, and like strawberries, for example, would be on one of those foods. Peppers would be, um, bell peppers would be there that um, are, are known to be the dirtiest foods in terms of the amount of um, pesticides and fertilizers and things like that that are used. Um, and we know that those things are poison for our gut. So there's no point trying to feed your gut something that's going to like, but at the same time, you're poisoning it as well. So those foods are typically try to buy organic, maybe less of them, but try to buy them organically. Other things um, I'd wash in like water and um, apple cider vinegar and really rinse them off really as much as I can. Um, I feel like I've completely diverted from what we're talking oh, about. Oh, no, no, we were talking about diversity and we got into gardens, which is good um, because I think organic and local is important. And yeah. You know, and we know that the diversity, the more, and even for me over this last couple of years, knowing that when, when we look at the studies and the research, it is that variety of foods, you know, yeah, and I because... think 
people often get stuck in those patterns, but we yeah. need to add in because we're going to get more the the flora that come in and the micronutrients that come in when we add variety and color, you know, all of these plants and, you know, what we eat, it's been put on the planet for us for reasons, right? Exactly. And, you know, that um, all the, um, the bacteria have their own, I like to say their own favorite foods. So if we're just eating like, a small variety of foods we only really eat feeding a small population of those guys but whereas we want like a massive big diverse colony right so we want as many of the the diversity as important as the numbers because they all have their different roles we know now so you know your brightly colored foods like you know your beetroots your bell peppers your berries like the, certain bacteria absolutely love those um your green leafy vegetables they provide like um the fiber that the other kind of bacteria like to feed off of so the diversity is really really important other things that you could add as well to your food that won't necessarily cost much would be herbs and spices um let's not forget they come from the ground as well so using you know seasonings like um, coriander seeds and turmeric and um, um, I don't know what other you know um, garlic um, onions all those kind of things that don't necessarily cost a huge amount but they do have a massive impact on our gut health so don't be afraid to use um, seasonings and spices and herbs to flavor your food and often you'll find that um, you probably eat less because the more flavors there are the, the more satisfied you'll be in eating. So you're not, if, whereas a bland meal, you're kind of just like eating it and you're just not, not really feeling um, satisfied, I guess. So you kind of just keep eating in order to feel satisfied, but that's not coming because the taste buds aren't being tantalized. Whereas um, some, you know, clever uses of herbs and spices can really help with that situation as well. And I think that's important to talk about the use of a variety because many people find that, you know, I'm eating this basic food, but I'm still holding on to weight. And yeah. often this comes back to, you know, it's blood sugar, but when the body doesn't get the micronutrients it needs, it, it feels like it needs to constantly be eating. And so it's going to hold on to things. So I talk to, especially women again and again, sometimes you need to eat more for your body to lose weight. Yeah. Because if you restrict and restrict, the body is, it's starving. It's looking for nutrients. So you need to nourish it with more of um, this variety of food. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, all the, all, if you think about all the different colored vegetables as well, and all the different colored fruits and, you know, with the fruits, I know some people, um, there's fruits are, they are nature's candy, but we need to find a way of fitting them in as well, because obviously like they bring, they bring a whole host of um, nutritional value as well. So, you know, we always, I always talk about, um, trying to add maybe, um, some fruit to a, a, a cruciferous, um, rich salad. Because now you've got that beautiful fiber in there from the leaves and everything else. And you're throwing in like, I don't know, some blueberries, blackberries, whatever you want to use. Some, some peach slices when they come into season and um, grilled on a barbecue work really well in the salad. So try to incorporate it. But without there, there are ways of having fruit without spiking your blood glucose levels is what I'm trying to say. Um and then fermented foods. Um, for centuries, people have been having fermented foods. And, you know, only now are we realizing the importance of those foods. So, you know, um, one of my favorite dressings that I put over, um, like I'd marinate a salmon in, or I'd even put over on roasted vegetables, would be a miso dressing. Super, super cheap to make, very easy. There's no additives, there's no um, preservatives in there. Um, essentially it's just miso paste, apple cider vinegar, olive oil, a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. If you wanted to, you could add probably a dash of honey if you wanted to, or maple syrup or something, put it in a jam jar, give it a good mix. And it will, it will obviously separate, but you can just give it a mix and it stays in the fridge and it's good for, for weeks. Um, and I always have that at hand because if I'm just quickly throwing a, some salad together, I'll give it a drizzle of that. And then from the soy, from the, um, soy paste I'm getting my fermented food as with the apple cider vinegar as well then I've got my good fats from the extra virgin olive oil um, and it just makes a really tasty dressing that I know hasn't got a lot well no additives in it and no artificial sweeteners no no gummies no, none of this kind of stuff that the shop bought stuff typically does have yeah we talk about that a lot you know the, the thing about whole foods you yeah. know like making your foods because if it comes in a box you know there's going to be the additives and preservatives and yeah. plus most boxed foods are going to 
have a lot of sugar, they have refined products and that's yeah. when the natural ingredients come in. Yeah. So one of the questions I wanted you to go through people is if you can just kind of describe to them though, because you know, you and I talk a lot about the vagus nerve and we talk about digestion, but just that importance of, you know, the body being in balance, slowing down when you eat, mm. um, how the, and just those digestive enzymes coming out and why people need to take their time as well with their eating. Yeah. So, um, so digestion starts, obviously the second that food goes into your mouth, because, um, your, your, um, the, the, the brain in the gut kind of start to communicate the digestive enzymes are then produced. So a lot of people don't actually chew, they, they swallow. So we're kind of missing out on the most important stage where you're kind of chopping that food down into like very, very small pieces so that the surface area that the enzymes have to attach to, you're kind of reducing that. So, so that's, that, that's not ideal either because we want things to kind of be digested and move along um, in, in a nice fashion. We don't want anything to stay um, stagnant. Um, and then by eating super slowly, then you know the the gut and the brain have time to kind of communicate, so that the, the next stage that the more more digestive juices are produced, so that they can do their job. So as um, the food goes down the GI tract, each section of or the the GI tract has its own um, enzymes that work on different food groups. Um, the problem with um, not sitting down and being on the go all the time is that obviously that doesn't happen because you're body is not really catching up with what's happening but also our stress levels like if you're and um, we spoke about that at diabetes center like you might not feel your, your stress but your body would be stressed because you're not actually sitting down and calming your nervous system down to actually enjoy and savor the food and rather you're just like putting food down your mouth without actually um noting what's happening so that has a problem in its own self because you're not registering what you're eating. So you, again, going back to not, not feeling satisfied and you want to eat more and more and more because it hasn't really registered as a meal. You probably feel like you need to eat more later on when you do finally settle down or whenever um, you get a chance. Um, and then so our stress hormone is cortisol. The higher our stress levels are, the higher the cortisol levels are. And again, it could be through to like mental stress or physical stress. Uh, and as those, um, as cortisol goes up, digestion can't happen because your body is getting ready for a fight or flight situation. So digesting food and absorbing it is not going to be the top of the priority. So then what happens is that food seems to linger around longer than it should. And certain things start to ferment where they're not supposed to ferment. And then we see signs of acid reflux, that kind of burny sensation at the back of the throat, um, that kind of like the, the, the after, like, you know, sometimes like when you eat something, it, you kind of like taste it after half an hour or so, an hour, whenever it comes back up at you, bloating, distension, um, belching, windy, all those things that really, if everything was working smoothly and it, everything was moving down in accordance like the way it should do, you wouldn't really be seeing those signs. Uh, and then again, it can lead to, um, diarrhea it could lead to constipation and all sorts of other things on um, on the on the exit as well so sitting down um trying not to have distractions in terms of like um devices computer work like trying to take yourself outside of your work situation for as much as possible like if you can just sit outside and get some fresh air in try to calm your mind down try to activate your um parasympathetic nervous system uh, as much as possible eat in a calm fashion um, and just chew like we always say try to put your fork down between each mouthful now I appreciate that might not be always um, accessible or available or you might not want to do that but just be really mindful that you're taking small bite fours and chewing 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 really chewing before you swallow that food down to give it its best chance of um, having the enzymes attaching to that large surface area to be absorbed yeah, it's, it's so important, you know, that whole, it's a complex process, the way that it goes on. It's so, so complex. And, but yet, you know, it's, it's just really about paying attention, being mindful, like you said, getting out of fight or flight, and yeah. we need to get into that rest and digest mode. Exactly, so, because the two can't work together. That's right. And so, and so much of healing is on that exact same lines, you know, we need to be um, more mindful of everything that we're doing, you know, and we know the impact that stress has on the gut. And then that cortisol can have that other impact too on the blood sugar. Um, but I think maybe 
because you and I, I know we have so much and I have lots of questions I would ask you, but I'm going to open it up for people that want to start asking some questions in the chat. Sure. Um, because, you know, it, we cover a wide range of topics when it comes to gut health. So one question we had was, um, so an individual is diagnosed with intrinsic factor deficiency associated with a low B12. Mm -hmm. So can this be reversed? So um, do you want to start on that or do you want me? <laughs> yeah, you go ahead. You go ahead. So, you know, a few years ago, I would have said, oh, if you have an intrinsic factor deficiency, then no, maybe this can't be reversed. You have to go on B12 for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. But knowing what I know now about gut health, in particular, a condition called SIBO. Mm -hmm. So when Nursa was talking before about some bacteria get in the gut and they ferment early. So SIBO means small intestine bacterial overgrowth, because most of our fermentation should happen lower down in the gut. But if bacteria rise up, then they'll ferment higher up. And so then what can happen is that area of your intestines doesn't absorb things properly. So that intrinsic factor may be more inflammatory related, and it may be to, due to the surface, the villi. So in our gut, we have like all these cil cilia that are there. They're meant to be really tight, but we can have things that happen and then they loosen. And that's what people call leaky gut. So if you have those conditions, that can actually contribute uh, for some individuals to that problem with B12 deficiency. Now, just another note, though, with B12 deficiency, some individuals will have, they may be intrinsic factor positive, but you can also have a genetic reason why your B12 doesn't appear to get absorbed. And that's called um, methylation or an MTHR defect. So I know a lot about these things because I had my genetics done and I'm MTHFR positive. I also have a vitamin D uh, issue where I don't absorb really well. So I think uh, in answer to that question, I would say really, it depends on you'd want to get your gut in really good order. Um, and of course, too, as I, nurse, I didn't mention celiac disease, right? Because, you yeah. know, for individuals that have celiac, um, then often they're going to have issues with uh, B12 absorption. Mm -hmm. I think um, I agree with obviously everything that you just said, but also like um, looking at the poop again would be interesting because um, how much of the protein that they're eating are they actually absorbing um, or digesting and absorbing? So um, again, from experience, my diet, I just, I know I do, I do well on a higher protein, higher fat diet. So I, I typically have um, in the region of 80 to 90 to possibly 120 grams of protein a day which is quite high and when I did my functional blood work with Dr Keenan um the protein content um was showing low and then again when we did the stool sample testing the first time around I ever did it we saw that I'm not actually digesting proteins because there was a lot of undigested protein so it could eat so again it goes back to like you know let's look a little bit further as to other things that could be going on as well yeah, and she commented that she does have vitamin D issues and her daughter has MTHFR. So, okay. and you know, some people might be there, well, oh, do I need to get tested for all these things? Mm -hmm. You know, we can get an indication from your blood work. So just for people that may be curious. So, um, you know, methylation and B12, it, it is a problem that, you know, can affect many individuals. I think 30% of the population can have an um, uh, of a defect. And so that they may have issues with B12 absorption, but if you have a healthy gut and you have a good lifestyle, then that may not be an issue for you. But if you have health, if you have gut issues, then even if you, then that's where that genetic defect is going to be expressed more. So I don't think we all necessarily need the genetic profiling, though it is helpful. And if you have the money, it can be good test, a good test to get. The company I've used is called the DNA Company. Um, they're based originally out of Guelph, Canada, but they, you can purchase the kits in Canada or in America. But it's really, it's the function. So looking at what is your vitamin D level, are you, and then getting your level rechecked to see, are you absorbing your vitamin D? And just like with, so with B12, the test that I measure in the office would be a basic B12 level, but I measure something called homocysteine. So this is a little beyond and above what we're talking about with blood sugar. But if your homocysteine level is up and your B12 is low, that can be another indication that maybe this is more likely an MTHFR problem. Um, and then if that's the case, then 
you know, it depends on supplementation and it depends on your whole health picture. And that's why every body is unique, you know, and one of the things in medicine that actually, it makes me more excited now, I guess this last 10 years. And the reason that I got, you know, so much into gut health is because I had gut health problems, right? And I had to solve some things, Um, but it's that every body is unique. And so as we start to work on treatment plans, just like Nurse said, when she started, it really has to be customized because what might work for you may not work for another. Just like tonight, we were talking about, someone said that they can have Ezekiel bread. So Ezekiel bread is you you can buy it in most frozen sections in grocery stores. And several people said, it's the only thing that doesn't spike my blood sugar. Whereas other people were talking about different types of breads. So it's really looking at um, your overall picture. And what we're trying to give you here is information and education so that you can start to ask the right questions. So when you see your doctor, um, you can ask those questions. And then if you don't get the answers, then you can find a functional physician, you can find a naturopath, you can find a functional nutritionist, someone that can help you as well further on in your journey. Good, okay. So do we have any other questions um, through our chat? Or while they're coming up, I wanna ask Nursa then, okay. Let's talk um, resistant starches. Okay. So I know a lot of people have heard those, probably heard of starches, but I don't think many people know what a resistant starch is. So resistant starches are really um, an interesting one, especially for people that are um, b- struggling with balancing their blood glucose levels, because essentially we we don't absorb much um, of those starches because um in the word, they're resistant to breakdown pretty much by us. But boy, oh boy, do those bacteria in the colon love them and they feed up on them and then they help to produce what we call short chain fatty acids, which we know has a major impact um, on our overall health and has anti-inflammatory effect as well. So short chain, um, so resistant starches would be things like um, potatoes and rice. If you cook them, it doesn't matter which type it is, If you cook them, cool them, they become resistant, even if you reheat them again. So that's a really easy hack to make, actually. So just if you could um, cook a little bit ahead of time or for leftovers, so things like potato salads would be really good, uh, rice salad would be really good. But even if you wanted to have a regular rice dish, you could just, if you were, you know, to cook it a little bit ahead of time, stick it in your fridge for about 20 minutes and then heat it back up again, stovetop it will become a resistant starch. So as I said, like the amount of starch that we, or glucose that we'll absorb would be much, much, much less than what it would have been had it not been the resistant. Other things would be green bananas and plantain. Now, plantain's not really part of um, my cooking. I haven't, I wasn't brought up cooking it. I didn't really know what to do with it. I honestly didn't even know like what, what, what to like, what to look for. Like, how do I know if it's a right plantain or not? So I've been through back and forth a lot and experimented with the plantain situation. And I finally found out which one is a good one. So essentially you want it to look like it's going bad. So it's just got black spots all over. Um, it's kind of like um, a, almost wilted on the outside and it is the most a simple dish to make uh, and I'll serve it instead of um, where I'd serve um, a potato or a starch um, as a meal um, and if you any of you follow me on my Instagram um, which is called eat all the pickles I've got recipes on there as well and ideas of where I've used it in my cooking uh, essentially you just slice it um, fairly thin and then I will just um, pan fry it in a little bit of coconut oil with a bit of sea salt on it and within less than 10 minutes it's done it's super tasty it's amazing for our gut bacteria and it doesn't really affect my blood glucose levels as is a resistant other resistant starches would be things like legumes as well so your lentils and beans and things like that um having said that not all legumes affect me the same way so i know that for example lentils um, don't spike me as much but things like chickpeas and red kidney beans seem to have more of an impact on my blood glucose levels so that's where I mean that we need to work together or you need to work with a nutritionist or you need to experiment with yourself just to see actually which ones work better for you um, or and then find out really like um, use your monitor to find out which one's better best for your uh, blood glucose rises yeah, it, it's, it's so great. And to hear you talk about serving the plantains that way, I really like plantains as well. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, you know, when people listen in, 
it can sound a little bit complicated, but you know, if it doesn't have to be like, at all. Like, yeah, and I say to people, if we lived in a world where we didn't have toxins and pesticides, then life would be much more, and we didn't have stress. Um, right. But we do live, we don't live in that world anymore. And so we just have to pay a little closer attention. And then the important thing to know with when you have if prediabetes or early diagnosed with diabetes, make the changes then, because when you do, your body knows how to reverse it. Yeah. So, you know, when we're talking about these foods and this variety of foods, start at, when you start to add in these little things, it's going to be maybe a little bit of work in the beginning, but in the long run, you're going to have a much better payoff because you're going to not worry about those long-term consequences of, of health issues. Definitely. So I'll get people, if there's anyone that wants to ask a question, feel free to just uh, unmute or you can turn your uh, videos on if you like, if ever anyone wants to ask a question, because I know that there's lots of curious people that are out there. Um, now, one of the questions that came, and I'll just follow it up because it came um, the other night was about probiotics. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, many people have heard of probiotics, they don't know about the microbiome, yeah. but is it enough just to take a probiotic? No, I'm just going to put the light on, it's getting the kind of dark in here. Um, so no, and I always, always say this to pretty much every single person that comes, sorry, is that light a bit awkward now? It's good. <laughs> um, that comes in, um, and I use this analogy all the time, and Probiotics are great, but they are a little bit like tourists. So if the gut environment is not attractive for them, they're not going to hang around long enough um, to have an impact on our uh, economy or on our health. So like tourists, if they go visiting somewhere for the day and it's not really attractive for them, they're probably going to get on the bus and carry on going to wherever else they're going. They're not going to hang around long enough to have an impact. So um, probiotics vary a lot in price, as we know. Um, I mean, the supplement thing is a whole other conversation that maybe we can have another day. But, you know, people often spend quite a lot of money on these things and they can be rather expensive. Um, it's absolutely pointless putting them, like taking a supplement, a probiotic supplement, if you're not going to feed those bacteria. So all the, um, the resistant starches we spoke about, the, uh, the cruciferous, the dark green leafy vegetables, um, your different kind of that eat the rainbow, the, the color, the, the most, the more, the more colorful the vegetable, the more um, the, those bacteria love them. Um, the diversity of your um, food that you're having. So if you're not going to kind of feed them, then your fermented foods, how can I forget? So all of those things are gonna make those bacteria hang around long enough to make an impact on our health and, and, and improve the diversity um, of the gut biome. Yeah, and so I think- Answer your question. Yeah, and, it's, and I think it's one of those things though too, it took, you know, as I was learning about this, you know, myself, you know, it's only the last couple of years we're hearing more about these prebiotics, right? And, that, and that's what we mean is that those good quality foods that feed the probiotic you know, or the other you know, bacteria that are living in our gut. Yeah. Um, and people don't quite understand that link yet that we need, like you said, we need right. the, the good bacteria, but we need the food to feed the good bacteria. Absolutely. And I think some of that is clever marketing as well um, from the companies that make these supplements and they make it sound like, you know, pop a pill and then you're going to get 50 billion parts per capsule and, you know, jobs are good and, and you're good to go. And um, what they fail to tell you is that you need to actually like feed these guys for them to hang around long enough. Um, so it's a little bit of, um, and you know, it, it makes me sad because again, like people make a lot of money on other people's ignorance and, and through clever marketing. So um, but it is what it is so that's where I think it it pays to do a little bit of research yourself as well um a question about rice and potatoes yes. so if you drain it under cold water just to cool it off would that work as well for decreasing the starch for the questions about decreasing the starch content by just rinsing yeah. them I would rinse it off anyway to get the starch off um, and you know again like depending on how you cook your rice the starch content can be really high or lower um, so typically I'm a, a per, from Persian origin so my mum would rinse and rinse and rinse the rice until literally the water was clear whereas I know like in certain um, cultures they would maybe not even rinse the rice at all and the rice becomes quite kind of sticky and kind of more like sushi kind of texture right so there's um, clumpy 
So um, the way you prepare your rice makes a big difference on the starch. Um, going back to whether it's resistant or not by just rinsing it, no, you'd have to, I would, what, what I typically do is I'd cook it, I'd rinse it and I'll stick it in the fridge for about 20 minutes and then I'd reheat it back up again. And then someone commented that pressure cooking can help as well. If you cool, like if you cook it in the pressure cooker, cool it down and then just heat it up, I guess referring to yeah, yeah. a way of a better way of cooking things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions out from our field? I guess we are getting up to 45 minutes too. So, um, well, I guess I just want to thank you so much, Nursa, for being here. Is there any other, I know we have so much to share, but is there anything else that you wanted, a message that you wanted to leave people with tonight? <laughs> yeah, I'd say, um, you know, in, enjoy your food. Like food, um, going back to my motto, it shouldn't be a source of stress. It's, it's for enjoyment. Um, but just pay attention to like what you're eating, how you're eating. Are you enjoying what you're eating? Um, and if you're ticking all those boxes, I think you're on the right track. Um, obviously, we spoke a lot about gut health today, and that's my um, kind of like speciality subject. So um, as a rule of thumb, try to eat pickled foods. Um, follow me on Eat All The Pickles. I've got lots of um, ideas on there on how to eat, like in, improve your gut biome. Um, try to eat fermented foods, um, all your kind of kefirs and yogurts and things like that. Again, like not all of those things are made equal either, but as a rule of thumb do not have anything that's sweetened or flavored in any shape or form because more than likely it's going to have some sort of glucose syrup or fructose syrup or something like that in it try to go for plain um, and eat the rainbow mm -hmm. eat the rainbow I love that and go visit a nurse's site um, eat all the pickles it's so pretty she has the most beautiful foods and she'll post and many many recipes as well so yeah. thank and you so much. In Bermuda, sorry, just to say, I've just yeah. collaborated with Brew um, in Bermuda and some exciting things are going to be happening. We're going to be working really closely to have some blood sugar balanced salads, smoothies and healthy snacks um, to have with your cup of coffee or to go. Um, so watch this space. There's going to be um, and we're going to be I'm going to, I'm going to actually be physically testing them out on my monitor as well. So I know they're going to be macro balanced um, and they're going to be very, very gut friendly. So check them out, hopefully as soon as next week. Right. So all those Canadians can come to Bermuda and you'll have yes, even more reasons to visit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Nurse. Thanks everybody for watching. Have a great Thanks evening. Thanks for having me. Have a nice evening. Bye. 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 Good night.